All right. Well, here I'm back again. Um, hoping you can hear, everyone can see this slide. Uh, thank you, uh, Rue and Dwight and Kathy, for inviting me. And uh, thanks to the previous speakers in the seminar series for, for giving a nice background to uh, what I'm presenting today. Um, so I won't, I won't cover a lot of the, the background information that was pre previously presented. Um, but today I'd like to give an overview about uh, our current understanding of the anticipated effects of ocean acidification on a phytoplankton in the future coastal oceans. Uh, with many talks, uh, I'm going to start with a, a similar plot, a very uh, familiar plot looking at carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, um, which is shown here in, in this red curve. Um, uh, carbon dioxide in, surface, in the surface ocean, uh, shown here in any sort of gold, goldish symbols. Um, and the corresponding decrease in pH uh, over the last uh, 20 or so years um, corresponding to the increase in CO2. So I first want to remind everyone um, of, of what we've seen in previous talks um, in that in coastal regions, um, especially in the Northeast where there are estuaries, uh, a shallow shelf, and freshwater input, that um, the variability in CO2 uh, in surface waters can be much larger than this sort of uh, on the order of 50 ppm uh, ability in surface oceans. So in the coastal oceans, um, from what we understand now, it looks like there's probably about two to four-fold higher uh, variability in CO2 concentrations um, on timescales as short as days and as long as weeks or seasons. Um, second, I wanted to show this plot uh, to, to show uh, the CO2 concentrations that we have in present day, which are about 400 ppm, um, a little bit higher than, than this last data point here. Um, and so, and the reason why I want to talk about these different CO2 concentrations is because most of these uh, experiments that I'll be showing um, are done our experimental manipulations of CO2. So um, most of them will have a treatment of CO2, uh, which is equivalent to present day uh, CO2 around 400 ppm, um, a doubling of CO2, which is the, the year 2100 estimate by various models um, based on our current emissions. Uh, and this will range um, in the, the studies that I'll show uh, anywhere from 700 to 1000 ppm or so. Um, and oftentimes you have pre-industrial uh, CO2 uh, treatment, um, which is down over here on this part of the scale, which is closer down, it's about 200 ppm CO2. Um, so that's sort of the framework of all the, the sort of plots and experiments that I'll be I'll be showing um, to discuss how how OA might be affecting uh, phytoplankton in in the future oceans. So this is sort of my uh, conceptual uh, graphical framework for how the talk will go. Um, so. Uh, Phytoplankton, um, which I'm showing here, is a, this is a, a microscopy image of, of different diatoms. Phytoplankton are dependent on, on various variables for growth. Um, so amongst them are light, nutrients, and temperature. Um, in this talk, I'm not going to be talking very much about light. Or, um, these are, are very large driving factors for how phytoplankton grow and, and what phytoplankton grow, and they deserve their own seminar. Um, and they're going to be changing. Light and temperature are certainly going to be changing in future oceans. Um, but I'll focus today on, on nutrients um, and changes, potential changes in nutrients, uh, both in availability and supply, um, on this sort of the growth-dependent variable side. Um, and then when phytoplankton grow, uh, there are a number of processes uh, that phytoplankton mediate, um, and I'll be talking about these as well. So uh, the rate of growth of different species um, or different taxa of phytoplankton, the composition of these species, um, and in for elemental composition I'm talking about uh, carbon fixation rates, for example, um, and ratios, meaning the ratio of the molar ratios of carbon to nitrogen and phosphorus, um, and also the production of nutritious compounds, uh, and uh, specifically polyunsaturated fatty acids, um, and toxic compounds, and these are harmful algal bloom uh, type compounds that are being produced. Um, and so the combination of, of, of changes in growth dependent variables and uh, the processes that I'd like to mediate um, eventually uh, culminate as uh, as a sort of mega organism or a community structure or a nutritional structure of phytoplankton, um, and that's kind of what I think the main focus of this work of of what we want to know is, is how will this change in future oceans and how will that affect hydrotrophic levels, um, and that's a it's a very loaded question. Um, so I'm going to start off uh, a section on on potential changes in nutrients, and I just want to make sure that everyone's clear that um, I'll be giving a synthesis of a number of experiments and publications over the last decade or so. Um, I, my hope is that I'll highlight some of the major findings and discuss their implications, so forgive me if I didn't include your work. Um, and the findings uh, from, 
uh, that the findings I'll present are from phytoplankton species, um, and uh, many of which are considered cosmopolitan. So um, they occur in, in many of our coastal oceans. Um, and many of the field studies that I'll be showing are these mesocosm field studies um, are from different parts of the ocean, um, from ranging from the, the Arctic to the Southern Ocean. Um, and so the point is that it's not necessarily regionally uh, specific work, but I think it's very regionally relevant work. Um, and in fact, there hasn't been much work on ocean acidification in natural phytoplankton uh, communities um, here in the Northeast, and, and maybe that's something that we can work on. Uh, well, it is something that work on, we're working on doing a little bit more of. Um, one last caveat is that I'm not going to be including any material related to plankton calcification for several reasons. Um, one, I think it can also warrant its own talk. Um, and second, Barney talked a little bit about this um, with uh, particularly inorganic carbon production in, in one of the previous seminars. So, so uh, we can go back and look at that in the webinar archive. Okay, so first off, starting with, uh, with changes in nutrient supply or, or nutrient bioavailability, um, one of the major findings in the, the last decade has been uh, a potential change in nitrogen fixation rates um, at high CO2. Uh, and so nitrogen fixation is, uh, is a process that's carried out by uh, cyanobacteria um, that they fix both carbon, like phytoplankton, and they also fix uh, dinitrogen uh, from atmospheric dinitrogen gas that equilibrates in the surface ocean. Um, and this is a potentially large and significant impact on future oceans because uh, nitrogen fixation uh, is a source of new nitrogen to the world's ocean. So this can change the balance of nitrogen um, to other elements or other nutrients in the ocean um, and potentially increase the amount of nitrogen available to phytoplankton growing in the ocean. Uh, perhaps uh, clinically it's a bit akin to nitrogen loading in coastal zones. Um, so this is a, a plot from, from an early study uh, in 2007 uh, showing nitrogen fixation rate here on the y-axis over a range of CO2 concentrations. And I've highlighted uh, sort of the present day and future ranges of CO2 concentrations and I'll do that in a number of other um, slides so you guys kind of uh, can get used to these windows. And so um, this study and also another study that was published in 2007 showed about a doubling, uh, expected doubling in CO2, in, uh, sorry, nitrogen fixation rate um, for this colonial cyanobacteria trichodesmium. Um, a follow-up study uh, with various cyanobacteria, um, both including trichodesmium, which are in these top two uh, panels, and a crocosphera, which uh, is a single cell nitrogen fixer um, that can be found in, in many parts of the ocean, um, show very similar uh, effects of rise in CO2. I think a very important part of this, this follow-up paper, uh, which was published in 2013, is that depending on species, um, you, can have a, a very, you can have varying shapes of the curve um, and various saturation of CO2 for nitrogen fixation. So for example, in this top right um, panel here with the, with the trichodesmium species, um, it appears that at, at present day CO2 concentrations, uh, nitrogen fixation rates are fairly saturated. And if you increase CO2, um, which presumably gives the cell a little more power and uh, energy to fix nitrogen, um, you don't see a very substantial increase in nitrogen fixation. Um, but then when you go to, to Crocosphera, for example, the species down here in the bottom left panel, um, you see a substantial increase uh, over the range of CO2 concentrations uh, of present day and future, um, similar to the, the original findings of trichodesmium. Um, so, so this is a, a potentially species-specific response. Um, there's been some field studies that have shown some marginal increases in nitrogen fixation, but in general, nitrogen fixes are very difficult to work with in natural communities. Um, so as with with uh, many of the other examples I'll show, this is a, a very uh, this can vary based on based on species. Um, one other thing too about nitrogen fixation is that it's very energy and uh, and trace metal uh, and requires trace metals uh, to drive. And so, with higher nitrogen fixation, of course, there'll be larger requirements for um, for relatively scarce resources. Um, that's something to consider for kind of putting this in a future ocean scenario. Okay, so the next part of the uh, uh, the nitrogen cycle that I want to talk about um, that was published in 2001 um, by some of my colleagues at USC uh, is uh, the effect of CO2 um, or acidification on microbial nitrification rates. Um, and this is actually a, a pH dependent um, response uh, as opposed to being a CO2 dependent response, which, which uh, nitrogen fixation is, is uh, hypothesized to be. Um, so in this case, uh, when pH drops, it, uh, it alters um, the, it, it favors, thermodynamically favors ammonia um, and decreases ammonia as a substrate for ammonia oxidizing bacteria and archaea. 
Uh, and so at, at CO2 constant, at a reduction in CO2, or sorry, a rise of CO2 and reduction in pH, um, it's expected that ammonia oxidation um, is reduced by roughly 10 to 40 percent. Um, and this is shown here for four different, uh, four different locations um, with the ammonia oxidation rate shown here in the, the y-axis and, uh, and, and the different locations here in the x-axis. Um, and so the, the significance of this is that if, uh, if nitrification rates do indeed decrease in future oceans, the balance between uh, the amount of ammonia available versus the amount of nitrate available, which is the, the end product of, of nitrification, um, could change. And a decrease in nitrate uh, could have some, uh, some major effects for larger species like diatoms that typically proliferate on, on, a, on high nitrate availability. So keeping on track with availability, um, another Another uh, recent finding pertaining to ocean acidification and, um, and nutrient bioavailability um, is this uh, particular example here that I show. Um, this is a, a plot, there are plots showing a temperate diatom um, and iron uptake rates by this temperate diatom with iron bound to three different chelators. Um, and so uh, uh, on the x-axis shows from low CO2 to high CO2 and present day is in the middle, uh, middle histogram bar. Um, and so when iron is bound to, um, to certain types of chelators, uh, apparently at low pH, and again, this is a pH-dependent uh, response, at low pH, um, iron tends to be less available, less bioavailable. Um, and this, is, this has to do with uh, the, uh, the structure of different types of chelators um, and whether or not they're protonated in seawater. Um, and so, for example, with ethylene diamine triacetic acid, this top example, and with deathyroxamine, on um, the lower panel, uh, there's a significant decrease in iron uptake rate and inorganic iron availability. In natural waters where, um, where there are a variety of chelators, uh, many of them unknown, um, it's been shown that there's about a 10 or 20 percent lower uh, availability of iron in these natural waters. Um, and a similar story has been shown for zinc um, in, in some recent publications. On the flip side, uh, in high, when there's a lot of dissolved iron or high dissolved iron concentrations, um, it appears that uh, with, high, with high CO2 or, again, with low pH, and this is pH dependency, that iron 2, the oxidation state that's more bioavailable, um, is more safe than the iron 3 oxidation state. So in this plot, um, this is data from a mesocosm experiment in northern Europe um, on day 22 of this experiment, and it shows dissolved iron concentrations, sorry, dissolved iron 2 concentrations um, to be about twofold higher at high CO2 versus the present-day CO2 concentrations. Um, so this is, this is a, again, an example from, from a very high uh, dissolved iron concentrations in the, say, 40 nanomolar range or so. Um, and this example here that I'm showing with uh, this chelator, uh, chelator effect of, of iron bioavailability um, is more in sort of open ocean type concentrations, so less than a nanomolar. All right, so I'll move on now to the phytoplankton media processes, and I'm going to split it up into two sections just to make it a little more digestible. Um, so the, this first section I'll talk about um, is on growth rate and elemental composition. Um, and so while these, these nutrient-based uh, availability uh, type changes are thought to be pH dependent, these are, are mostly CO2 dependent. Um, although uh, down, and when we get down here to these to pressure of these compounds, it's sort of still not quite under, fully understood why changes in CO2 are, are affecting changes. So this is a plot showing um, different growth rates of uh, phytoplankton in culture experiments. So these are uni-algal culture experiments. Um, this is a plot that I borrowed from, from a, an older publication um, with a number of, of diatoms and other species. Uh, so what, what this shows is growth rate uh, in, in a per day unit. Um, roughly 0.7 per day is about one doubling per day. Uh, and this is over a range of CO2 concentrations. So for these, uh, these previously published uh, experiments, these are all in these open circles, the open symbols. I've superimposed a number of experiments that we've conducted over the last few years here at the Northeast Fishery Science Center um, for comparison. Uh, and I just want to show sort of a, a few different patterns. Um, and so in addition to this sort of saturating growth rate curve, uh, we also find that some species um, have no response or have no sensitivity to changes in CO2. Um, we see some species that have a maximum growth rate uh, at a certain CO2 concentration and, and declines, and some that have um, growth rates that are positive to CO2. So similar to the nitrogen fixation story, um, 
these the response to CO2 is fairly species specific, um, which makes it a little bit messy for interpreting a little um, a little more nebulous of a of a concept. If you look at carbon fixation rates, um, this is an example um, that I'm I'm also borrowing from from a, a group in Europe. Um, this is a, a plot showing uh, carbon fixation or or prime productivity relative to maximum productivity. So um, so for example, at 400 ppm. Uh, what we have here in this gray is, is, a, is a diatom, is a relatively large diatom. And so at present day CO2 concentrations, um, it's performing carbon fixation at about 80% of its maximum carbon fixation rate um, at much higher CO2 concentrations. Uh, the next example in the same plot is for, uh, is for a non-calcifying haptophyte in this, in this, uh, this uh, the shaded area. And the hat area is for um, the calcified haptophyte, Amelianea hexuli. Um, and so these are sort of major players or considered to be major functional groups in the world's oceans. And so the take home message of, of this plot here is that there are some, and also the plot to the left, there are some species that, um, that are poised to be winners or they are poised to gain something. So for example, um, if you're looking at carbon fixation of, of E. hux, um, the, the uh, relative photosynthesis rate or carbon fixation rate is about 25% at present day CO2 concentrations. And as we double CO2 concentrations, it has the most to gain. It, it almost doubles. It can almost double its carbon fixation rate. Um, so that's that's sort of a, a a really important part of the story with changing CO2 and and um, what we expect uh, prime producers or how we expect prime producers to change. So this is an example I want to show of a field experiment, and there's been a number of field experiments, um, and. Uh, this is in contrast to the culture experiments in which only one species is being grown. Um, this is from a mesocosm experiment in northern Europe. Um, it's one of three large mesocosm experiments. Um, and when I say large, I mean uh, 20,000 liters large per replicate. So this is supposed to be a little more of a holistic uh, type of CO2 experiment. Um, and so what this is showing is carbon, uh, sorry, it's chlorophyll A, which is a proxy for phytoplankton biomass, um, over a span of about 19 days. Um, and each of the, the different symbols represent different CO2 concentrations. And the, the gist of this is you don't really need to know which CO2 concentration is which. But the gist is that the net growth rates are about the same. Um, and that's been the finding for some of these mesocosm experiments. Some have seen slightly higher uh, net growth rates in high CO2, um, sort of going along with what we see in culture experiments. Um, but if you look at this, even though the growth rates are about the same, if you look at the community structure um, at the, the peak of biomass here, um, so this is community structure for the three different CO2 concentrations that are shown. If you look at the community structure based on, um, in this case, it's based on the phytoplankton counts, um, you see a fairly drastically different community structure. Um, so comparing specifically the, um, the uh, present day CO2 concentration treatment to future CO2, um, you see a reduction in the number of uh, these uh, small autotrophs. You see a reduction in the number of, uh, of EHUCs. You see uh, an increase in uh, Micromonas, which is a, a small presenophyte, um, and also in the large diatoms. If you uh, compile all of the findings thus far with these natural communities, um, you see a number of different responses. Um, and so you kind of get a mixed bag. You see some, um, in one case, uh, a cyanobacteria came, uh, was more successful, a dinoflagellate in one example, um, a couple examples of of uh, presentophytes or haptophytes being uh, the most favored, um, and then some that are consistent with some of the culture experiments that we've run, um, that diatoms or larger diatoms are are, uh, are favored at high CO2. So the jury is still out on this. Um, and it's probably because natural communities are very, very complex, um, and that the interactions uh, between nutrient supply and grazers um, are not very well constrained in all of the experiments. And so each of these experiments may be seeing an interaction of CO2 with various other, uh, various other community controlling parameters. OK, so the next section here is on elemental composition. Um, and, and in this slide, I'll show both culture and field experiments. These are, uh, these are showing carbon to nitrogen molar ratios and nitrogen to phosphorus molar ratios. Um, and expressing it as a percent change from, uh, from present day CO2 to future CO2. Um, I brought this plot from, from uh, Hutchins et al. 2009 um, that, uh, uh, that compiled a bunch of uh, different culture experiments ranging from diatoms to dinoflagellates. But, um, and I added in a few of the, the more recent references, um, which you kind of see are kind of uh, shoved in there in a, in a new column over here. 
Um, and so the, the basic gist of, of what's happening in culture experiments um, is that we see a general rise in these molar ratios um, at higher CO2 with a few exceptions, or we see no change. Um, when we see rises, we see rises on the order of 10 to 25 percent. Um, so, so nothing extremely dramatic, but, um, but still uh, somewhat of an increase. If you look at natural communities, so this, this again is a compilation of various natural community experiments, um, the changes, uh, the signs of the change are, are all over the place. Um, and there's also many in which uh, these molar ratios did not change. Um, and this is difficult to interpret, again, probably for similar reasons as, uh, as why we have various uh, findings for community structure with, uh, with higher CO2 concentrations. If we do take, uh, take the culture phytoplankton work uh, for what it is, in that there may be alterations to carbon to nitrogen and nitrogen to phosphorus ratios, um, this could have fairly substantial uh, impacts on elemental cycling, um, on uh, carbon and nitrogen, or the ratio of carbon and nitrogen exported to the deep ocean or to the shelf. Um, and it could potentially impact food growth structure in that uh, grazers tend to have much lower and much less plastic uh, molar uh, elemental compositions. And so when they are encountering food that's of different or potentially higher uh, molar ratios, they need to spend a little more energy getting rid of the extra carbon or getting rid of the extra nitrogen um, to access the phosphorus that typically limits grazers. Um, so that's, that's one potential implication of this type of work. Um, I wanted to show one example, actually it's the only example, um, of work that shows uh, uh, a difference or a, a OA-related change in bioactive trace metal requirements. Um, so in this case, this is a subarctic diatom that's grown in culture. Um, we see a similar increase in carbon to phosphorus ratios and nitrogen to phosphorus ratios uh, at different CO2 concentrations. And we also see a decline in iron to phosphorus and zinc to phosphorus ratios um, in that same diatom. Uh, and this is consistent with the, the hypothesis that has to be um, phytoplankton rely less on carbon concentrating mechanisms which are resource uh, are resource dependent. Um, so they require less energy. Um, that's an iron dependent process, and they require uh, fewer enzymes that are zinc required that require zinc. Um, one of the interesting parts of this um, is that growth rates in primary production increase at higher CO2, and so. In fact, what you find is that the use efficiencies of iron and zinc um, are are much higher. So you need much less you need less to grow, and you can grow more at high CO2. All right, so this is a, the last section of the talk um, that I, I want to touch on, and, and these are changes potential changes to these nutritional compounds or toxic compounds produced by by phytoplankton. First, with these uh, with the nutritious compounds, as I mentioned earlier, um, this is uh, this is basically uh, concerning changes in polyunsaturated fatty acids. These are essential fatty acids that are synthesized uh, solely by phytoplankton that are passed up into the higher foods, um, higher, higher trophic levels. Uh, this is an example um, of a, a recent report uh, looking at the percent of total fatty acids uh, at two different CO2 concentrations. Um, the fatty acids are grouped into three different classes of polyunsaturated fatty acids in which the essential fatty acids fit. These are where the omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids are. Um, and the monounsaturated and the saturated fatty acids. And so the decline that these, the authors of this, uh, this manuscript um, draw attention to is a decrease in polyunsaturated fatty acids. So about uh, half, about decreased by half of polyunsaturated fatty acids in the coastal diatom species grown in culture. Um, and the interesting thing they did and the next step they went through, they went to, is that they fed this diatom growing at different CO2 concentrations to uh, a coastal copepod. Um, so not only did they see that, a coastal, that the copepod had lower fatty acid, polyunsaturated fatty acid content, but also it affected the egg production rate. Um, and so this plot uh, shows egg production rate in uh, eggs per female per day um, at low CO2 concentrations um, over here, which range from about 10 to 40 uh, or so eggs per female per day, to uh, at high CO2 or food grown at high CO2. Um, had a reduction down to about five to ten uh, eggs per female per day. Now our same work, or similar work that we've been doing, um, looking at fatty acid composition um, in in diatoms, um, actually we don't see this decrease that was reported. So uh, in this plot, I'm showing polyunsaturated fatty acids in these dark, dark bars, um, and monounsaturated and saturated fatty acids uh, expressed as a total as a fraction of the total identified fatty acids. 
Um, so in these two cases, um, and, and with several other phytoplankton, um, we don't see a decrease. We don't see the significant decrease that's reported um, in, in polyunsaturated fatty acids, um, which you can see here. Uh, and this is across a range of CO2 concentrations. Um, and interestingly, this, is, this, uh, this top plot is for Thalassia cyrus pseudonana, which is the same species that was shown, uh, that was used for this experiment, although the strains are different, and probably their growing conditions are somewhat different as well. So there's still some work here to try to figure out what's going on with, uh, with these essential fatty acids with, with phytoplankton in a different CO2 concentration. And I wanted to show one example from a field experiment. Um, while there's little known about fatty acids in these natural communities or what CO2, how CO2 can affect fatty acids in natural communities, um, this is one example from a cause an experiment, again, in North Europe, um, where uh, this is a, a plot showing the percent of total fatty acid that polyunsaturated fatty acids account for. Um, the gray is present-day CO2. The blue is uh, uh, pre-industrial CO2. And the orange is high CO2, or year 2100 CO2. Um, and so what they found is that in phase two and three, um, so sort of in day 20 to 25 of this experiment, um, polyunsaturated fatty acids were significantly higher in the high CO2 uh, treatments. And so in order to sort of backtrack and try to figure out why that is, they used, uh, they used specific fatty acid markers um, for diatoms and dinoflagellates and for other groups of phytoplankton to try to figure out what accounted for this high, these, uh, these high polyunsaturated fatty acids. Um, and so with the diatoms, we can, what they constructed here is they showed that at a high CO2, actually, um, PUFAs were rather low in diatoms, and they showed higher CO2 uh, avail availability for dinoflagellates increased the amount of PUFAs. So they attribute this increase in polyunsaturated fatty acids um, to a, a shift in community structure. So dinoflagellates were, um, were more common um, or dominated in high CO2 treatments uh, in phase two and three of the experiment, and that's what drove the change in polyunsaturated fatty acids. Okay, so this last section is about toxic bloom, toxic bloom species. Um, and I'm going to show two examples, one from the diatom pseudonychia that produces demoic acid, and also from uh, the dinoflagellates alexandrum that uh, is responsible for paralytic shellfish poisoning. Um, and I think that these are uh, these are really important to, to sort of take into consideration because um, when you're thinking about changes in ocean acidification, um, or when you think about ocean acidification and you think about changes, potential changes to phytoplankton, I think one of the clear and present connections that we have to human health um, is related to these these uh, these bloom these toxic bloom species or these harmful algal bloom species. Um, this is an experiment in which uh, with with pseudonychia. Um, which is a diatom that produces demoic acid, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and the y-axis showing demoic acid uh, in picograms per cell and at different growth rates. Um, so if you look at the open circles here, uh, this is showing that as CO2 increases, the growth rate increases. Um, and this is when all the nutrients are, are available, including silicic acid. Um, so growth rates uh, increase from about 0.1 to about 0.4 per day at high CO2. Now when, you, when, when they're grown silicic acid limited, um, which are shown here in these black circles, um, growth rate also slightly increases as CO2 increases. But what happens uh, with the moic acid production is that it dramatically increases. Um, so under nutrient stress at high CO2, uh, there's uh, a reported higher toxicity for pseudonychia. If you look at the dinoflagellate alexandrium, um, in this case, uh, this plot showing saxitoxin uh, equivalents for uh, uh, and fed the moles per cell. Um, if you look at a control versus high CO2 condition, you see a doubling in saxitoxin. Um, and also at high temperatures, um, at higher temperatures than, than, uh, than the control, uh, you, see, you also see a, an increase in saxitoxin production. Um, and so interestingly, as with uh, the other examples I've given, there's, some, there's still some back and forth about it. So there have been some recent reports of higher growth and toxicity in the agathandrium species that's found in the local waters here in the Northeast. Um, but a recent paper with two strains of Alexandrium uh, found elsewhere have reported a decrease in parallel shellfish poisoning toxicity. Um, so again, there's sort of a mixed bag as to, to what's going on. But there certainly is a, identified a few potential impacts of high CO2 um, with these species. All right, so this is a, this is the second last slide. Um, and I kind of want to give an overall summary about what I just said. Um, so on one hand, uh, we have these growth-dependent variables, and I talked about nutrients. Uh, 
we think that in general there probably will be somewhat of an increase in nitrogen uh, to the oceans in general, and that will, um, if it's in the, the open ocean, that will be reflected in the coastal oceans at some point um, through mixing or pulling. Um, in terms of nitrate bioavailability, uh, because of the, the potential effects on, um, on ammonia oxide, uh, the ammonia oxidizing bacteria in archaea, we may see a decrease in the amount of nitrate available. For iron and low iron systems, uh, it's expected that, that pH uh, might, affect, might decrease the amount of iron that's available uh, to, for phytoplankton uptake. Um, in high iron areas, there might be a more favorable, uh, favorable situation for iron 2, which is a more bioavailable form of, of inorganic iron. For the phytoplankton mediated processes, uh, for growth rate, for nitrogen fixation, carbon fixation, and the elemental composition, there are cases in which we see increases in these, but there are also many cases in which we see little or no difference. Um, and so, uh, and this is mostly from from, uh, from culture experiments. Um, there's that one example I showed you of, of, a, of a lower requirement of some of these scarce trace metals um, that may have some major implications for fuel oceans. Um, and then for fatty acids and toxic compounds for these, these sort of uh, metabolites that that, uh, that phytoplankton produce. Um, there's some evidence for decreases in fatty acid in these essential fatty acid production, um, and and perhaps no change. And this is still there's still a lot of work that needs to be done um, in this field. And again, a mixed bag here for for some of these uh, these uh, toxin producing um, phytoplankton. So the, I mentioned earlier, the main question I think that we all want to know is is um, will community structure or, or will the nutritional structure of phytoplankton change? Um, and we can say probably. Um, by how much and when is a, is a pretty good question. Um, and will this affect the higher trophic levels? Uh, it's likely. Um, but I'm, I'm not saying yes to, I'm not saying a resounding yes to any of these. Um, because I think it's that we have to acknowledge that uh, while well, we're certain that changes, that OA will change carbonate chemistry, um, and we're certain of what those changes in carbonate chemistry will be, uh, we're far from certain about how that will impact uh, biology, uh, biological processes, and bio biogeochemical feedbacks. Um, so I think there's still a lot of work to, work to be done uh, on that, on the behalf of, of, uh, of how this will impact the rest of the ocean. Pressing questions for the future ocean. So um, these are, these are. This is sort of my in a nutshell that I was requested to give uh, by the organizers. Um, so the the experiments that I showed suggest that potentially significant alterations uh, are likely going to happen to processes associated with or mediated by phytoplankton. Um, and I think an important question is how will these effects play out in the actual ocean? So um, all these experiments are enclosed in one way or another. Um, and many of the experiments are in cultures uh, that are in the lab that are uh, grown under fairly unrealistic conditions. Um, and we're also missing uh, the bottom-up effects of nutrient supply and the top-down control of the grazers. So um, I think we really have a long ways to go to really understand how uh, OA will affect phytoplankton in, 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 uh, in a real dynamic complex complex ocean. We're just scratching the surface. Um, and, and I think we can make some headway uh, if we kind of focus in on, on the major environmental drivers that might be uh, changing in the future. Secondly, how will uh, CO2 variability in the Northeast interact with river and estuarine inputs, wind buoyancy driven nutrient supply, and wide continental shelves? Um, so for example, as we heard in previous talks, what are the effects of, uh, of poorly buffered, of uh, the changes that OA changes in poorly buffered fresher coastal waters? What, what effect will that have on, on these phytoplankton processes or, um, or associated processes? And also uh, with the broad shells that are fairly unique to this northeast region, um, perhaps there's a higher uh, capacity for organic matter storage uh, that sinks. Um, and and I think that maybe there might be some OA interaction with, with uh, benthic remineralization processes that we can consider. Um, and a lot of these are, are relatively unexplored and, and probably 
should be explored. Finally, will organisms, both small and large, adapt to the changes that come? Um, will it be a situation like we've seen in some of the mesocosms where um, they play similar functional roles, but they're different players, they're different species that are, are, uh, are doing the same thing? Um, or are there going to be sort of these larger changes that, that, we, can, that we predict for sort of the, the worst case changes? Um, and also, how will this restructure the higher trophic levels that I, I mentioned in the slide before? Um, I think I'll, I'll go out on a limb and say that we have a ways to go uh, for a quantitative understanding of how the lower trophic levels affect higher trophic levels in the present day oceans, let alone in 100 years. Uh, so I think this is, this is really good catalyst for understanding how our oceans work today and how they might work in the future. The good news is that we have a great team of people uh, working on both the, uh, the observation part and the experimenting part um, here in the Northeast region. The goal is to disentangle results from the multiple experiments that I've shown that often have conflicting, conflicting results. Um, and I think that if we try to gain a mechanistic understanding of what's going on, um, we can address the potential changes to the ecosystem. The research that uh, I've been involved in over the last few years and peppered throughout the talk. Um, and so I'd like to call the hard work of my coworkers and collaborators uh, at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, University of Rhode Island, and the University of Southern California. And the funding uh, sources for this work by the NOAA Ocean Institute Program and NSF. Thank you. <laughs>